Good morning. We are going to be in Matthew chapter 6 as we continue in the Sermon on the Mount. As we noted earlier, Jesus says he has not come to abolish the law of the prophets. He came to fulfill it. And over the last few weeks, we've seen Jesus continue to, to bring up these various laws of God. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not covet your neighbor's wife. Do not bear false witness. Laws of retribution. Laws of loving your neighbor. But this week we see, and, and by the way, Jesus continues not only just to not only to give these laws, but also to radicalize them. His whole intent here has been to not just see a law, but also to realize the the inner problem, the inner ethical problem of that law and and why people fail. So this week in chapter six, Jesus is going to illustrate for us how people continue to do things that, that God has asked us to do and that are good for us, but they're corrupt. And especially with these religious leaders, as Jesus is going to hit this morning, he calls them hypocrites. And hypocrites is simply a, a word that's used of Greek actors who wore a mask. Here we are in a, a time of a pandemic, and we think that we are the only ones to wear a mask in church. And the fact of the matter is, it's just not true. That people have been wearing masks for a long time. They've put on masks in order to play a different part. And here with these Pharisees, they're doing these things that were important for righteousness and, and transformation, and yet they were inwardly corrupt. I like one particular definition. It says, hypocrisy is doing the right things for the wrong reasons. Here in chapter 6 and verse 1, he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Practicing your righteousness. It's the same word for righteousness found back in chapter 5 and in verse 20, when he shows us that, that the transformation of the heart that is needed in order to enter the kingdom of God. Now here in chapter 6 and verse 1, we see this ongoing process, this, this external things that are going on in order to help us in this transformation to be more like our heavenly Father, as he mentioned at the end of chapter 5 and verse 48. But that's not the case with the hypocrite. Because even though he does these good things, we see that he also has can be corrupt. I like one particular um, fourth century church father, Ambrose of Milan. He said, he has no concern for righteousness, but great concern for reputation. He would, bl he would blush if anyone saw his sin, but he doesn't blush for the sin itself. And that really is what's going on here. Ironically, our public religious life can become a temptation for others to admire our spirituality. And so Jesus says, don't practice righteousness to be seen by others. Now, wait a second. Didn't Jesus earlier tell us that we we're to be the light of the world? like a city that is set on a hill so that others can see our good works. So is this a contradiction? Not at all. What Jesus is dealing with in both of these situations is our motives. Why do we do these good works that others may see them in Matthew 5 and verse 16? He says, so that they may give glory to our Father in heaven. So here in our text, Jesus illustrates the wrong motive, and that is to do these things so that other people will glorify us. It's spiritual vanity. Why do we do the good things we do? That's the question I think we need to focus in on this morning. Jesus is going to give three examples here that are valuable in developing our personal righteousness. We often refer to these as spiritual disciplines, which are important. Jesus says when you do these things, not if you do these things. But he says 
It's also important that we understand why we're doing them. Now, these are not a complete list of spiritual disciplines, but that's not the purpose of what he's talking about here. It's about why we do them. And so we begin this morning with, um, with giving. And so he says in verse 2, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Israel took it very seriously, giving to the poor. You can see an example of it in Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 11. But Jesus says, don't sound the trumpets when you do. Don't toot your own horn, in other words. It's, it has no spiritual value whatsoever when you do those things so that others see you. And it doesn't matter how much you give to the poor. If you're doing it for the wrong motives, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's meaningless. Now, no, God does reward those who do acts of righteousness out of a pure motive for the needy. In fact, we're going to see in all three of these examples, he says there's a reward that God wants to give you. But just because you're doing good things doesn't mean you're going to be rewarded if it's unless it's done out of a right, pure motive. He continues on. Now we go to prayer. And he says in verse 5, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Although individual prayer could be offered anytime, pious Jews, they offered public prayer three times a day, morning, afternoon, and night. See an example of where this draws off of in Psalm 55 and in verse 17. Now, Jesus isn't against public prayer. Jesus prayed before the multitudes in the, in the feedings. Next week, Jesus is going to teach us how to pray as we get into the Lord's Prayer. And it begins this way, our Father who is in heaven. Not, don't pray this way, my Father who is in heaven. Not that that's wrong, but he's showing them a communal prayer. Our Father who is in heaven. And, and so when we offer up these prayers in public, if, if it's, we're tempted to be focused on us, he says, you know what? Go get into a private room. Go to a private place so that only you are there and the Father, and you can commune with him in your heart. He also mentions these empty phrases and many words. And by mentioning the Gentiles, he may be referring to these pagan phrases that they often believed they would use these and they believed it had some kind of power to them. Our God is not going to be manipulated. He is, it, it, these kinds of things are meaningless. And what did he just say here? He says, God already knows what we need. And so prayer is a way of expressing our need, our desires, our absolute dependence upon our Heavenly Father. And folks, that is the very central theme of the Lord's Prayer that we're going to notice next week. It isn't wrong to offer up long prayers. Jesus prayed all night in Luke chapter 6. It's not even wrong to repeat certain desires that you have in prayer and needs, as Jesus did the same in the Garden of Gethsemane in in uh, chapter 26 and verse 44. Here's a third one he talks about, and it's fasting. Fasting. Let's go to verse 16. So he says, when you fast, 
do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces and that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Fasting takes real self-discipline. And so it's a temptation to let other people know by looking downcast and disfigured. It became a form of religious pride and hypocrisy because they were drawing attention to themselves. And, and people admired those who, who would fast, you know, twice a week as the Pharisees did. But Jesus says, that's all the reward you will ever receive. Now, once again, Jesus is not against others knowing that we fast. Of the 16 references to fasting in the New Testament alone, almost half of those are communal fasts where people come and they express their sorrow, they seek forgiveness, they, they seek God's, um, God's guidance. On November the 3rd, we're going to pray and fast as a congregation. It's the day of the election. We're going to seek God's guidance in these things, for God to intervene, for, for God to um, do what is best, regardless of whatever we think may be the best, for us to trust God in those things. A time to, for us to confess and to repent before God uh, as we have lived out our lives before our nation. The solution is not to abolish fasting, but to set it within its biblical framework and sincerely seek God's blessing upon it. Why do we do the good things we do? We really don't see people standing out on the street corners, praying or walking around, you know, kind of dis just, uh, you know, looking like they're fasting. I've never seen anyone sit over a collection plate and they're just counting out their money in front of others. But I have had people try to convince me of what a spiritual person they are by how much they give, whether to charity or whether it be given to the church. I have had people try to convince me what a good Christian they are because they read their Bibles regularly or they volunteer uh, to do various things. And usually this happens when the conversation is about someone else that they're being judgmental about, and they are showing their own spiritual superiority. Or maybe they've been called on the carpet, but that is not the way to the kingdom of God. Writing to the Philippian believers in Philippians 3 and verse 3, Paul says that his glory is in Christ Jesus and that he worships by the Spirit of God. That is, he worships, um, but he does not put his confidence in the values and, and the activities that are unaided by his Spirit. All he is, he says, is by God's grace and mercy. And then he goes on in verse 4, and he says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I count loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. I mean, do you really want to get into a, a spiritual spitting competition with the Apostle Paul? You're going to lose. He could have used it to receive praise. But Paul says the only thing that matters, the only things that matters is knowing, trusting, and following Jesus. In verse 9, he says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, 
but that that which comes from faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And it wasn't that all the good that he had done as a non-Messianic Jew was despicable, but that his pride in them was despicable. Why do we do the good things we do? Does our baptism fill us with pride because of what we've done or with humility in knowing what Jesus has done? In taking communion, the bread and the cup, does it fill, fill us with a superiority over people that we look out, out in our world and we see them as sinners? Or do we see this as a moment that we realize that we were sinners and Christ died for us? Social media is the modern day blowing trumpet. It is the virtual street corner where some Christians go to brag about themselves or to put things there to make other people feel like, wow, what a spiritual person that they may be. And I know I need to be careful here because I don't think we should become people who are judging and su suspicious of everyone out there that puts out, you know, maybe pictures of baptisms or, you know, things they're excited about in Jesus or scriptures or quotes. But that said, it can become a place that we want to tell everyone how great our life is compared to everyone else. It's easy to become judgmental of others. And preachers are tempted to. You know, much of my work has to be out in public. It's, it's in a very public forum. It's easy to want people to to want to be impressed by, you know, my knowledge or by, you know, some kind of amazing delivery. A spiritual leader, they can be tempted to think that they have it all together or want people to think that they have it all together. A spiritual giant who has no fears or struggles. And in case you don't know, I'll let you know, I don't have it all together. I, I, I am a sinner in need of God's grace and mercy on a daily basis. At times, I've been a terrible husband and father. I struggle with depression. I'm overweight. I battle with impatience. Sometimes I don't say things the right way. And if you want a complete list of all of those, you can get with my family. I've come a long way on different things throughout the years, but that is only by the grace of God and his spirit who indwells me and has helped me and transformed me in whatever way. But I can only boast in Christ. Even the Apostle Paul, with all the spiritual credentials he listed, he says in Philippians 3.12, not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and stri straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Why do we do the good things we do? May we in our lives glorify our Father in heaven by everything we do. Or maybe you're someone and, and you're, it's time for you just to give up trying to convince people what a good person you are and, and just become obedient to God. You know, some people, they reject baptism because I'm a good person. They reject needing church because, well, I'm a good person. But the fact of the matter is that all of us have our struggles. All of us have those things. The things that we learn in Scripture, we learn that the community of Christ, he says in Scripture, is to build up one another, 
to admonish, to encourage, exhort one another, to care for one another, to bear one another's burdens, to forgive one another, to be patient with one another, to look on the interest of each other, to pray for one another, to confess our faults to one another. Does this sound like a group of people who've got it all together? No. Or maybe you are a child of God and it's time for you to confess of your sinfulness of maybe the things that you've taken pride in your own self and look down upon others. You may need to ask God to help you right now just to press on to the goal. But whatever that may be, go to God. Submit your life to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for allowing us to be here this day. Father, we love you so much, and Father, we just pray that we continue to put our focus and our eyes upon you. Father, may all of us, this very day of as we worship as a community of people, may our motives be pure and holy as we sing forth these songs, as we offer up these prayers, as we take communion, as we see one another, and as we move out into our community for the rest of the week. Father, may we be pure as we continue to try to be perfect as you are, Father. Father, our boasting is in your Son. We thank you for his sacrifice, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.